In this session, we're going to look at a Torah psalm, Psalm 19. Now, a Torah psalm is a psalm about the law. Typically, Torah is translated law, but we need to understand it as a broader concept than that. A better translation could be instruction or even broader knowledge of God or revelation of God. Now, specifically, it refers to the Torah, the, the books of Moses, the law, but uh, English use of the word law has some connotations to it that don't necessarily exist in, in Hebrew. So we wanna think of this more broadly as instruction. This is a psalm about the instruction. The word of God is typically the synonym we use for that, the word of God. There are three of these psalms in the Psalter. We've already met the first one. Uh, psalm 1 encouraged us to meditate on the Torah and to delight on it day and night. Uh, then we have this one, Psalm 19, which has a section of five verses that focus on the Torah of God specifically, the, the written word, but the whole psalm is truly about the Torah. And then we have Psalm 119, which is this massive magnum opus of the Psalter, 176 verses, every one of them speaking to the word of God and expressing devotion, love for the law of God. Um, so, we don't have time to do 119, so we're gonna do Psalm 19 today. And Psalm 19 is also classified as a creation psalm. So it does have some things to say about creation, but that's because God speaks through creation. Uh, so the psalm unfolds for us in three different movements, and each of them describe the ways that God speaks to us. So the first is that God speaks to us through his world. God speaks to us through his world, what he has created. The psalm opens by saying, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. The heavens referred to the highest uh, heavens above, so the stars and the beyond. The skies refer to the, the near atmosphere, the clouds, the sun, uh, and the beauty that was there. And so these two, the heavens and the skies, they're declaring, they're proclaiming uh, the glory of God. I think what this is telling us is that God is speaking through his world clearly. It is, it is a clear message. And in fact, uh, we know this. We can look today and to see uh, the beauty of, of the sky, particularly in light of modern abilities to see well beyond our solar system, uh, we, we see the glory of God on display. It is very clear. Second line says, day after day, these pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. So it's not only clear, it's also continual. It's consistent. It's dependable. In fact, this is truly the basis of modern science, is this ability to observe things over and over again. And it's that consistency, that order in nature, the, the natural law uh, that causes everything to work. Uh, that is foundational, and God is speaking through that constantly. The fact that there is a natural order to things is evidence of God and of the nature of God. Uh, verse three then says, uh, there's no speech or language where his voice is not heard. Uh, his message goes out to the ends of the earth. And so not only is it, is it clear, continual, it is comprehensive, it is everywhere. There's, there's no language barrier here. Everyone in the world uh, can see God's existence, God's handiwork, God's glory through what he has made. Uh, this is echoed in the book of Romans. Romans 1 verses 19 and 20 says that, that what can be known about God, we, we can see his eternal power, his divine nature. These are seen by everyone. It's clearly understood so that if you don't believe this, you don't have an excuse. God's revelation of himself, his Torah to the world is through what he has made and it's very clear, it is continual, and it is comprehensive. He then is going to zoom in on one aspect of uh, his world, and that is uh, the sun, and the glory of the sun. Uh, now, the sun was worshiped in many cultures. There was a sun god, but notice what this psalm, the psalmist says about it. He says that in the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. God is not the sun. God's greater than the sun. God God tucks the sun in to bed at night in his tent. The tent's probably referring to the clouds. So he's describing here a sunset. And then he has a couple other metaphors to describe the sun. First, he says it's like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion. I, I can see this be interpreted two different ways. 
Uh, one is that this is the bridegroom coming out of his pavilion, prepared to be married. So he is dressed in the finest. He is strong. He is young. He is handsome. He is a beautiful sight to behold. And so perhaps that's what the metaphor is getting at, that the sun rising each day is like a bridegroom getting ready to start the day, his, uh, a, new, a new life as a married man. There's another approach, uh, Eugene Peterson, when he translates this verse in his message, he says, it's, it's not about the wedding day, it's the wedding night. He said, it's like the bridegroom coming forth from his honeymoon bed, jumping out of his honeymoon bed with life, with vitality, with this promise of new life that he and his wife have just created the night before. That's the way the sun is. The sun comes out each day and it gives life. And so whichever way you go, this is a picture of beauty and power and life-giving capacity that the sun is. And God tucks it into bed each night. The sun also then is described, secondly, as a champion, rejoicing to run its course. So uh, rising in one end to the other, like a runner who never tires, who's a marathoner, and just goes at it every day, day after day, without fail, like a champion. That's also a picture of the sun. And so this meditation on, on the sun is an exclamation point to this fact that God speaks through his world. And the sun is, is one case in point of God's beauty, power, glory, uh, in the sunrise and the sunset, and, and its capacity to give life. The second way that God speaks, according to this psalm, is in his word, his written word. This would be verses 7 through 11, where the psalmist says, The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are are pure and they're righteous altogether. Uh, they're more valuable than gold than much fine gold. They're sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and in the keeping of them, there's a great reward. In five verses, the psalmist says about all he can in those short verses about how great the word of God is. The nature of the word of God, there are eight attributes that are listed there. Uh, the effect of the word of God on us, there are four of those. Uh, the, the value of the word of God, more than gold. The joy of the word of God, the pleasure that we get uh, from receiving this knowledge of God is like honey. It's a warning to us as well as a reward. It's, 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 it, it established boundaries for us so that we can have the good life that Psalm 1 promises, a life that's fruitful uh, like a tree. So God speaks to us through his word. Theologians call this his special revelation, where God speaking through his world is his general revelation. So God speaks to everyone generally through his world. He speaks to those who can read in human language and hear it in human language. He speaks through his written word. And thankfully, God's written word has been translated into thousands of languages all over the world. And that work continues to get the word into the hearts of people. There's a third way the text reveals that God speaks to us. I'm going to say that this is the fact that God speaks within. The psalmist goes on to say, who can discern his errors and forgive my hidden faults? Keep me also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I'll be innocent of great transgression. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. God also speaks to us within. The psalmist speaks of his heart, the meditations of his heart. That implies that God is in our heads. God is in our hearts. He speaks to us. Uh, Isaiah tells us that you'll hear a voice that says, this is the way, walk in it. God speaks within. Uh, Isaiah, uh, in, in uh, Psalm 51, uh, verse 9, David says uh, that uh, in his prayer, he says, take not your Holy Spirit from me. In Psalm 139, he says, where can I flee from your presence? Where can I go from your spirit? So God speaks to us within, within our hearts as well. This is also echoed in Romans. Romans 2 tells us that the law of God is written on our hearts, on the hearts of every human being, that we, we know by nature what is right and wrong. Every human being has this internal sense of justice, of right and wrong, that's written on our hearts. So God has written his word on our hearts, even if we 
don't have a Bible, there is still truth that is encoded on our hearts as image bearers of God. There's a final way that God speaks to us, and that is through Jesus. Now, how do I get to Jesus from this psalm? It's actually not too hard. The last two words of the psalm, God is identified as rock and redeemer. It's not too hard to see Jesus, our cornerstone. That's the word that he used to identify himself. And Jesus as redeemer. Colossians 1 says he's rescued us from the dominion of darkness. He's brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Jesus is our rock and redeemer. And David couldn't see a thousand years ahead um, to see that, but he uses those terms, rock and redeemer. And David also recognizes, I can't, I can't save myself. I can't obey the law well enough. I have, I have hidden faults. I have errors that I'm even not aware of. And so David, even in his prayer, recognizes, I need a savior. I need a redeemer. And that's Jesus. Jesus is the final word. Consider the words of the writer of Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 1. He writes, in the, in the past, God spoke to our fathers. In, um, in the past, God spoke to our fathers in many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. Now, the son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his power for word. Jesus is the creator of the world. Jesus is the word of God. Jesus is the final and complete and perfect revelation of God. Jesus is God in skin, God that we can see, that we can touch. And 1 John says, that which we have seen, which we have heard, which our hands have touched, this we proclaim to you. The incarnation is the ultimate and final and complete way that God has revealed himself to us. John's prologue begins, John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 12, and the Word became flesh and pitched a tent among us, and we've beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father. God has made himself known in so many ways to us that there is no reason not to believe in him and not to trust in him. We can look at the world around us and see his glory and his beauty, and his, his, the natural law, by which everything operates. We can look at the pages of scripture and find light uh, for our eyes, warmth for our hearts. We can listen to his voice, his Holy Spirit within, guiding us and directing us, convicting us, drawing us to himself. And we can look to Jesus and the pages of the gospels and we can see this is what God looks like, God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, the Torah 